October 1915. The land of Cornelia Dijkma's forefathers wasn't what she thought it would be. She had imagined Europe to be largely tamed, its landscape beaten into submission by millennia of human settlement. But she was wrong. There were still places that were wild and dark yet, places old and alien, places humans were never meant to tread. Along a lonely stretch of the northern Ardennes, two riders broke over a ridge with the first dawn's light. They hunched miserably against the biting wind slicing across the naked hilltop as they picked their way toward the windbreak of the forested slopes below. They had been traveling for a week and had reached the Ardens three days prior. The first day after they'd slipped into the ancient woods, they had spied lumber camps and the odd hunter or trapper between the trees. They'd given them a wide berth, and since then, the two riders had seen no one else. This was good. Their mission was such that the less people saw them, the better. Cornelia Dijksma and Rosamond de Graff were knights of the Order of Bona, knight couriers for the Order of Joan, and they were carrying a parcel bound for the Dutch Order headquarters in Rotterdam. The parcel was important, and quite possibly dangerous if such secrecy shrouded their journey. If it were anything less, Cornelia was sure that speed would have been prioritized over their stealthy route. That was about as far as Cornelia or Rosamond's speculation went. Bona couriers seldom knew the nature of the contents they conveyed, especially these days. If she were to hazard any further guess, Cornelia might suspect it was an item from the Troy's Order Armory to be transported to the Netherlands for safekeeping while the war raged on in France. As Cornelia and Rosamond pierced the tree line and threaded down into the larch and spruce, the cutting wind dissipated, to be replaced by the omnipresent damp and cold of the high fins. Cornelia drew the edge of her scarf up over her chilled nose. It immediately slipped down again as she twisted to glance behind them. Still think there's someone behind us? Rosamond said, her own voice muffled behind her scarf. It's a head that you should be more worried about. Despite their care, somewhere just before they entered the Ardens, they must have been spotted. Something was following them. At least, that's what Cornelia thought. They, whatever they were, were still at a considerable distance, but their presence could be felt just as a hand not quite touching one's shoulder could still be sensed. Cornelia shifted in her saddle, leaned back as her faithful steed, Willa, stepped her way down a slope. She had heard tell of a sorcerer that had recently been stirring up trouble with the locals, but the matron couriers at the Troy's headquarters had assured her that there hadn't been any new reports of him for months now. Rosamond didn't seem concerned either. I have never encountered him before. I've taken this route three times this year alone. He's likely been rotated to the front, she'd said when Cornelia had asked about it. Yet that uneasy feeling lingered. If it's soldiers, they shouldn't bother us. Cornelia could hear the doubt in her own voice. There had been enough reports of knights being caught in the line of fire to bring that assertion into serious question. Hence the very special but oh-so-uncomfortable vests they both wore underneath their coats, specially crafted by the Dames de Lac to stop bullets. Very few of them had been made, as they were quite difficult to construct, which lent even more weight to the theory that their cargo was important. Rosamond was quiet for a long moment, the back-and-forth calling of morning birds filling the silence. It's not soldiers I'm worried about she said. What do you mean? Brom, Rosamond Skelding, snorted, steam issuing from his flared nostrils. Silence stretched again, but this time it had a different feeling to it, tense and slightly hostile. There had been many of those between Rosamond and Cornelia. Their partnership was new, and not begun under the best of circumstances. The Knights of Bona seldom traveled alone, they were assigned to partners or teams that worked closely together, sometimes for years. But Rosamond's partner had fallen ill shortly before this mission, and Cornelia 
An American, newly arrived to aid the European couriers, was assigned as the replacement. While Rosamond was a native to the Netherlands and could travel freely across all borders, Cornelia's claims to Dutch citizenship were less convincing to hostile factions, any number of which constantly surrounded them. She had been born to Dutch parents, who themselves held few memories of their homeland before their families took them across the briny gray Atlantic to America. So, while they were roughly the same age, Cornelia pushing 40, Rosamond just on the other side of it, and both of them shared any number of similarities in profession and preferences, they still felt out of step with each other. Rosamond, for instance, knew the Ardens well, and moved as seamlessly through the landscape as she did through the towns and villages studying the corridor between France and the Netherlands. To Cornelia, the high fins were alien, and while she could speak Dutch fluently and French passably, the people were equally so, their culture and customs familiar, until suddenly, and without warning, they weren't. Clearly her question had tripped across one of these invisible divides and exposed her ignorance of something. The history and culture of the place, or perhaps the larger wartime situation in the Ardennes. Cornelia waited for an answer patiently. It wasn't her fault that she was ignorant, and if Rosamond had an issue with it, she had better let go of her ill feelings fast. They wouldn't serve either of them well. At length, Rosamond admitted, There have been reports of a creature in the area. A unicorn. Instantly, any number of paintings, tapestries, and woodcuts sprang to Cornelia's mind, all fanciful, all featuring gentle creatures yielding to the touch of maidens, all colored by the rosy recollections of childhood fairy tales first told to her by her mother, and then by her to her own daughter, Nora, at bedtime. She touched her collarbone. Beneath layers of cloth sat her ID tags and a charm. A unicorn. Cornelia traced it, her daughter's tiny unicorn cast in silver on its chain. Do you think we'll see it? Pray that we do not. At that, Cornelia looked askance at her partner. I don't understand. Do they teach you nothing in the American order? About unicorns. Cornelia shrugged. Not especially. It isn't relevant to us. There are no unicorns in America. Their conversation halted as they focused on navigating through a particularly rocky outcrop along the hillside. Once they cleared it and their horses' hooves were again striking soft mud and larch needles, Rosamond continued. Unicorns are not simple, biddable horses with magic horns on their heads. They are vicious, highly territorial, and powerful beyond belief. They have been known to eat wolves, lions, and men alike. Understand this, Dixma. They are not horses. They are not sweet. They are intensely magical beings, and they do not take kindly to humans trespassing. They walked this earth long before man, and they do not favor us for what we have done to their garden. After this grim proclamation, and an additional short silence, Rosamond went on to describe the recent rampages this unicorn had been on, destroying any farm less than 250 years old in the region. Anything that was built after it went to sleep last, she said, as if that were all the explanation needed. Cornelia contemplated these new, disturbing facets of unicorns as they continued their trek north. It was slow going. The forest was thick, the terrain rolling, sometimes rocky, sometimes wet and spongy, and the cold mist that had risen with the sun was replaced by the chill haze of low clouds dragging their pale fingers through the trees, making the autumn yellow of the larch and blue-green of the spruce a vague suggestion of colors in a ghostly white field. It was impossible to tell the sun's position in the sky, but Rosamond seemed to know exactly where she was going anyway. Cornelia never once saw her consult the compass tucked away in her coat pocket. Occasionally, they would hear movement in the woods around them. Cornelia's hand would drift toward her sword then, situated in easy reach between her saddlebags. Rosamond would pause and listen before declaring it a deer or a fox or, in the only instance she betrayed any anxiety, a boar. Finally, the clouds lifted, 
just in time to reveal a dimming sky. As the light leached from the heavens, Rosamond and Cornelia dismounted and went about making camp in a small, grassy glade. While Rosamond busied herself with making a shielded campfire, Cornelia ventured up a nearby slope to collect spruce needles for tea. Stay sharp, Rosamond called after her. There are boars about yet. And unicorns? Cornelia jested. And unicorns. Rosamond did not sound amused. Cornelia sighed. She had yet to successfully crack the hard, flinty exterior of her companion, and really she was beginning to despair of ever sharing a laugh with her, let alone a smile. Maybe they'd never see eye to eye, figuratively as much as literally, since Cornelia was nearly a foot shorter than willowy, wiry Rosamond. Perhaps that was why Cornelia found the unicorn such a singularly interesting line of thought. She was starved for any reprieve from her partner's unrelenting solemnity and the unpleasant tension caused by their mismatched temperaments. Or perhaps it was because of her daughter's own preoccupation with the creature. The creature Rosamond described did not match her own notions at all. Were unicorns the pure white they always seemed to be in paintings? Cornelia wondered as she plucked some needles from the nearest spruce's lowest branch. Or was that as much a misrepresentation as their sweet temperament apparently was? If they were as vicious as Rosamond claimed, could anybody hope to be spared from their wrath? Did unicorns favor virgins like in the stories, or was that a fiction as well? If that was true, she certainly wouldn't survive. She recalled what her daughter had said when she'd told Nora the fate of all unicorns in the oldest tales. The hunters would pay a maiden to help them capture it. Unicorns are drawn to innocence, you see. And once the unicorn appeared before the maiden, the hunters would kill it, then present its magical horn to the king. Fie on that crusty old king! I wouldn't let them kill it. I'd say that I'd help, and then, when the unicorn came, I'd turn around and fight them myself! She'd made a jabbing motion with her imaginary sword to emphasize her point. Cornelia laughed a little at the memory, her eyes growing wet. She lifted her head with a heavy sigh and froze. There, standing on the ridgeline, backlit by the dying light, was a horse. Instantly, Cornelia checked its forehead. It had no horn. A horse, then, without a rider or saddle. It was large, at least seventeen hands tall, dark-colored, possibly a bay, and well-muscled. Hello, she murmured, transfixed. What are you doing here? Though she'd spoken softly, its ears twitched. It was a marvelous beast. She'd never heard of wild horses in the Ardennes, at least not in modern times. That meant it had to have escaped from some village, or even been released into the forest to prevent it from being commandeered by one army or the other and turned into a draft animal which was practically a death sentence at this point. If so, she applauded the owner's resolve. It would truly take an act of love to release, and possibly lose, such a fine specimen. Taken with its beauty, Cornelia stepped forward. No sooner did she move than the horse tossed its head and bolted away, instantly dissolving into the deepening dark. I saw a horse just now, Cornelia said as she returned to camp gratefully stepping into the orange ring of light cast by the fire. Just a horse. No rider. Rosamond only paused briefly from her habitual inspection of her kit. Strange. I wouldn't expect to see stray livestock this far into the woods. She frowned. We should move on early tomorrow. We can't risk being discovered by whoever might come looking for it. Cornelia set to brewing them some tea before settling onto a fallen timber and shoving her hands into her coat pockets. Her gloved fingers traced the squared edge of their precious cargo, tucked safely into her coat's inner pocket. The package was a small, book-sized parcel wrapped in wax paper, wound around three times with cord, and sealed by a large wax seal. While invisible to her naked eye, She knew that each component was imbued with heavy enchantments waiting to be undone by a magistra with the appropriate key spells. 
lucky spells weren't the only way to open the package. The right magician might be able to crack it, or even non-practitioners if they had the brute strength. But the key spells were the easiest way to do it without damaging the object inside or breaking some tools and losing a few fingers along the way. A matching package remained tucked in Rosamond's saddlebags, but that was the decoy, yet another indication that whatever they were carrying was immensely valuable. After a quick supper of dry rations and checking to be sure Willa and Brom were secured to their tree for the night, they bedded down close to the campfire. As it was every night, Cornelia took the first watch, and Rosamond dropped immediately into a dead sleep. The Ardennes were quiet at night. Cornelia imagined it was different during the spring and summer, but in autumn, with the blanket of winter looming, there was very little sound once the sun set, save for the wind in the trees and the occasional screech of a fox or hoot of an owl. But that night, there was no wind, and no creature so much as peeped. There was only the soft crackling of the fire. At first the eerie silence only registered as a feeling of unease, a wrongness Cornelia couldn't quite place. Then she realized, and she glanced over at the horses. Normally they sighed and shifted over the course of the night. But now, she noticed with tightening dread, they stood stock still, ears pricked, eyes alert and glistening. They were watching the tree line to her left. Slowly, she followed their line of sight, the hairs on the back of her neck prickling. The fire's light did not reach far, and the sky was moonless. Just the tops of the trees were visible as a jagged line of deep, starless black against the night sky, and the trunks of the nearest trees glowed weakly in the firelight. The forest behind them lay in utter darkness. From somewhere behind her, she heard a twig snap. She jumped to her feet and whirled toward the sound, hand on her sword's hilt, eyes combing the tree line as the horses snorted and stomped nervously. The darkness was impenetrable to her eyes, but she had the distinct feeling of being watched. Another sound at her back, from the direction the horses had originally been looking, and she turned again, drawing her sword. Silence returned except for the fire and her own quickening breath beating the cold night air. Yes, there were things moving out there, two at least, but she had met such odds before. She had fought men and monsters alike in her own country. Such was the life of a courier. Carefully, she nudged Rosamond with the toe of her boot, never taking her eyes from her scan of the tree line. Then... Slithering in from somewhere back in the darkness between the trees, she heard it. <laughs> a low, quiet chuckle. A shock of adrenaline bolted through her, making her stomach drop and her muscles clench, ready for battle. But her hardened resolve fled as another sound split the air, her battle readiness shifting instantly to blind terror. It was a horrible thing, unlike anything she'd ever heard before. A sound somewhere between a shriek and a roar. Behind her, the horses squealed and thrashed against their leads, and Rosamond erupted to her feet, immediately wide awake. The darkness between the trees was suddenly filled with a cacophony of sounds, thrashing in the undergrowth and splintering wood and bursts of those hideous bellows. It came from all around them, as if they were suddenly in the eye of a storm. The treetops swayed, needles and leaves raining from their branches and curtains. The horses! Rosamond cried. Cornelia ripped her gaze from the chaos of the forest and focused on Willa and Brom. Their eyes were wide, the whites showing as they rolled in terror, and sweat streaked their sides as they struggled against their restraints. Brom's lead was fraying under tension, and Willa's halter was cutting into her flesh. Forget the saddles! Rosamond said snatching up her saddlebags and throwing them over her shoulder. We must leave now! Despite weighing 40 pounds, Cornelia tossed the saddlebags over her shoulder with ease, fear fueling her with strength and speed. 
Rosamond was desperately trying to get Brom to stand still long enough for her to jump on his back, and Willow was likewise dancing around, rearing and kicking, churning up the turf beneath her hooves and turning it into a muddy wallow. Cornelia had handled horses all her life, and there were ways of calming them, but one look at Willa and she knew that no technique would work. In this state, Willa was a thousand pounds of panicked muscle. She could instantly kill Cornelia with one kick, or run her over. Yet she couldn't remain this way for long. Either she would finally snap the lead and bolt, leaving Cornelia stranded in the middle of this forest with whatever was circling them, or she would snap her own neck. Just as Cornelia came to this conclusion and felt the cold, clammy fist of despair close around her heart, the surrounding woods fell silent once more. Willa and Brom snorted, their frantic struggles slowing, but they remained agitated and shivering. The abrupt change did nothing to comfort Cornelia. The opportunity it presented, though, could not be passed up. Making a soft, shushing sound, she sidled up to Willa and stroked her damp flank. Willa froze, as did Brom, and stared into the forest once more. Cornelia didn't wait to press her advantage. She cut the lead, knotted her hand in Willa's mane where it met her withers, and hoisted herself onto her back. She expected Willa to buck or bolt. After all, under this much stress, any weight on a horse's back could trigger its deeply seated prey instincts. Yet Willa remained still, save for her heaving ribs and rolling eyes. Then, a figure emerged from between the trees, stepping into the glade. The first thing to break the border of darkness was not its head nor its legs, but one single dark horn. The horn was long. First its tip appeared, a sharp point glistening in the orange firelight, and then more of its length followed, and more. The whole thing had to be a yard long, Cornelia thought, at once terrified and strangely detached from the moment. The animal it was attached to was equally enormous. As its head emerged from the black, it became clear that it was taller than any horse Cornelia had ever seen or heard of, seven feet tall at the shoulder at least. As it drew closer, Cornelia realized that its similarity to a horse was only passing. The paintings had it all wrong. A unicorn was not a horse with a horn on its head. A unicorn was a monster. Its head was closer to a camel's than a horse's, but even that was a flawed comparison. Its black eyes glittered, reflecting the fire's dancing flames. When it tossed its head and snorted, its lips drew back to reveal long, sharp canines amongst its other jagged teeth. A black lion's mane poured from behind its ears to its shoulders and across its powerful chest. Halfway into the glade, it halted, just enough of it visible to see that its legs ended in heavy, cloven hooves. It was horrendous. Seeing it wrenched Cornelia's heart. Unicorns were supposed to be beautiful and pure. That's what she'd taught Nora. This was an abomination, the corruption of that tender, noble ideal. No beatific love emanated from it. Simply the raw, merciless, uncaring power of nature at its most elemental. For a moment, nothing moved. They stared at each other, the two riders and the unicorn. Then, from deep within the unicorn's chest, a rumble issued. It was more like thunder than a growl, but its meaning was clear just the same. And with that, the shock that had held them all frozen released them, and all hell broke loose. Willa jerked and reared, and Cornelia fought to keep her seat as the horse wheeled and went headlong into the trees. Cornelia didn't have enough time to draw her arm back in. It was smashed and scraped against the tree trunk as Willa charged into a flat-out gallop. Bright, white-hot pain lanced up her arm into her shoulder. Cornelia almost toppled from Willa's back, but years of riding reflex took over, 
She tightened her hold through her thighs and knees and flattened herself against Willa's shoulders, clinging for dear life to her lead and mane. Willa tore through the black forest, heedless of direction and careless of obstacles. Several times they passed under branches that, if Cornelia had been sitting tall astride her, would have unseated her immediately if not taken off her head. As it was, needles and twigs scratched down Cornelia's back and sides. Cornelia clung to Willa, eyes shut, face pressed between Willa's withers and her own shoulder. Still, she felt something sharp sting across the narrow sliver of exposed skin between the top of her shoulder and her helmet's lip, and blood began to flow freely from the cut. After running a mile or two, Willa finally slowed to a stop. Between her blustering coughs, Cornelia could just hear the sound of trickling water. After a few steadying breaths, she lifted her head. The cut above her brow had already started to clot, as had the blood that had run down and pooled around her eye and cheek. Her eyelashes were glued together by it. Carefully, she let go of Willa's mane and worked the blood from her lashes. Once she could open both eyes properly, she saw they were near a small stream running down a gentle slope. The forest here was less dense, They'd gone down in elevation into the deciduous trees. Most of their reaching branches around here were already bare, and starlight penetrated the sparse canopy to the leaf-carpeted ground. The oppressive air that had hung over their campsite was absent here. The hush was the natural autumnal kind. It was safe, for now. How long it would remain so was impossible to judge with that monster out there. Cornelia shuddered. But Willa was exhausted and could go no further, not immediately, and no amount of coaxing on Cornelia's part would change that, not to mention that they both had injuries she needed to attend to. Cornelia slid off the mare's back, staggering as her feet met the ground. By some miracle, she had managed to keep the saddlebags slung over her back. As she slid them from her shoulder, twigs and needles rained down around her feet. A quick look reassured her that the pouches were thankfully intact. Yes, she had managed to keep hold of the saddlebags, but she had lost her sword. And, as she pulled her compass from her pocket, and the starlight illuminated the silvery spiderweb cracks across its face, she realized it had broken sometime during their mad ride through the trees. Their mad ride in a direction she did not know, would not know, until sunrise, which had left her alone in a land as familiar to her as the surface of the moon.